lovely introduction. Now I'm in trouble because uh, I'm always trying to uh, under, uh, promise and over deliver, but here goes my plan. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for coming here tonight and uh, welcome. Give yourself uh, a round of applause, please. <laughs> Another loud one to the organizers and the volunteers of this conference. Please. Well, my name is Mohammed Al Salman. I'm originally from, I'm from Syria, from a city called Dara. I come from a really tiny uh, family of eight people, and, <laughs> and I'm kind of in the middle of the family. So I have three older siblings and two younger ones. So basically, the three older ones get to boss me around, and when I, of course, try to do that to my younger siblings, it doesn't work out. So, this is my life. <laughs> so, anyways, where's my finger, by the way? Okay. Uh, this is not my presentation. Sorry for that. City called Dara, and, and city, uh, the city of Dara is in size as Halifax in, in terms of size and population. So coming to Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, it wasn't a big change for me in terms of walking down the street and say hi to everyone, and as lovely Nova Scotians do. And before I, I start, I want to show you a video of why I'm here today, actually. Adversity. Learn from it. Leadership for me is when you overcome adversity. Learn from it. Take that experience and help others. As a person who overcame many obstacles coming to a new country and starting life from scratch, my goal as a leader is to help others to integrate and be positive and productive community members. I am Mohammed Masama and I'm looking forward to meeting you all at the East Coast Student Leadership Conference 2018. City Dar is known as the food basket of Syria, where all the exactly, <laughs> where all the fruits and you know vegetables produce come. Uh, most of it comes comes from my city. And fun fact about this: when all my friends in the summer used to go travel and even or work or gain experience or something like that, I, with my brother who's here tonight, actually. Uh, <laughs> I spent so many summers working in the farm, making that produce for sale. <laughs> so, the reason that I'm focusing about Dara is because it's where my story started, where everything started. But before that, I want to show you something. We all know that leadership has so many aspects, and it can be demonstrated by so many ways. And one of those ways is to lead by example. Can anyone give me an example about leading by example? Yes, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, please. Stopping at stop signs. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Thank you. 
I have uh, a funny video actually to show you, and we'll talk about it later. Go just escaped our neighborhood where our house was bombed. 
and we couldn't, we couldn't find a place to stay, we didn't know where to go, and we heard that this area is a little bit safer from uh, you know, the bomb. So I called my friends in the neighborhood and we decided to do something about this. And we knew that there's a person who, who lives in our neighborhood, but he doesn't use his house. He's traveling. So we called the guy and we asked him for permission to put this family in the house. And that news traveled so fast, by the next day we, we, we found five people in the street. By two weeks we found we had 50 families. And by one month we had about 100 families in our families in our neighborhood asking for help, food, shelter for them and for their kids. Of course, our movement grew fast. We couldn't just, you know, the five or six guys of us uh, to help in the neighborhood. So we asked the families who lives in the neighborhood actually. And we had so many volunteers. One would volunteer to bring milk, another to bring rice, another one to cook food for one, one family. And then the whole neighborhood started to do, to do that. And of course, the government didn't like this and considered this as an act of treason against the country. So one day, my brothers and I, we are sitting in the living room, and I hear a knock on the door. And actually, my brother, he goes to open the door. And the moment he opens the door, soldiers kick the house, the, the door down. And they storm into the house, and they immediately put my, me, my brother, and my other brother against the wall with handcuffs behind, behind our back and without uh, our eyes at all. To your knees, to your knees, where are your guns? That's what they said. We were so surprised. Uh, guns? What are you talking about? Where are your guns? This is the final warning, or I'm going to shoot you in the back of your head. And then my dad runs into the room. Please, they are my kids. They don't have anything to do with, with this. What are you talking about? They are just students. And of course, they don't like the answer. So they take us to the pre precinct for questioning, and they say, it's going to only take one hour. And that one hour lasted a month in a basement with no ventilation, with 150, with 150 guys in the same prison, with no shower, no bathroom, no water, and under torture. Every day, they would take us for questioning, where are the guns? again and again and again. But after a month, when they realized that they had nothing on us, we didn't do anything, they let us go. And of course, when we went back to our neighborhood, we found many, many other families have came to our neighborhood for help. And again, we didn't stop. We continued to help these families. And of course, the government didn't like that. So they came again to our house. They take me with my brother and another for one hour of questioning and that hour of questioning is a whole month. Same thing, torture, question, torture, questioning, within, they don't find anything, they let me go. And then my mom said, okay, this is it. Third time is not a charm. We have, we have to leave the country. So my dad, my dad calls his friend who has a small van who knows a way to smuggle people to the, to the border, border of Jordan. But if the guy doesn't give us a timeline, when, when are we going to leave? So one day I'm, I'm having breakfast with my mom, and I told her, so what's the plan, what's going on? She's like, why don't you give the guy a call? So I called the guy, and he's like, oh, you didn't know? We're leaving in two hours. I was like, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So I told my mom, she's like, well, run, grab whatever, whatever important to you. So we run across the house like crazy people to find, you know, our personal documents, you know, certificates of schools, that anything important that prove who we are. We grab our things, and the guy comes. He put us in the small van, and he said he knows a way where he can smuggle us. And then on the way, he stops on, on one of the curbs and he says, oh shit. <laughs> and I was like, okay, what's going on? He's like, this checkpoint wasn't here yesterday. And there's a sniper up there. And that sniper kills people every day. 
and we only have two hours window to escape from my house and to the border where the shooting, the bombing, everything stops to let the people go and live their life. So during those hours we went and then we found the checkpoint. And then the soldier comes to the driver's side and he's like, what's going on in here? And the driver says, oh no, it's just taking my family for a visit here. And he's like, why are you having bags and luggage in the, in, the, in the car? And the driver takes money and shakes the hands of the soldier and gives him the money. And basically the soldier opens the way and says, take this road. Takes the road, takes us to the border. And then the moment we land there, a bomb just 200 meters dropped behind us. And then the soldiers, Jordanian soldiers, they said, who has a phone? And we were like, all of us have phones, but why are you asking? It's like, they monitor the border. Once they know there's a signal close to the border, they bomb the area. So be careful. We turn up the phones, they take us across the border to a tent. And from there, they gather the families who are escaping every day from Syria, and they take them to a refugee camp. We arrive to the refugee camp, and then we were a little bit lucky because we had some money with us and we had to we, we could have escaped the refugee camp after a while because the living situation is zero there. There's no water, no food, and it's in the desert. And it's it's tents. Nothing like no concrete, no houses, no nothing. It's just tents. So we leave to the capital and we have an aunt there. We live, we live with her for a couple of weeks, and then we found we are our own place. But here's the catch. In Jordan, as a refugee, you're not allowed to work. And you're supposed to live and provide for your family. How? Nobody knows. But my brother and I, we found a loophole in the system. We worked online with a company based in Dubai. And we were doing translation from Arabic to English. In this way, the Jordanian government had no control on us and they couldn't stop us. We thought so. The lady who was, I was, we were working with her, she used to send us money over Western Union transfers and you know, those kinds of transfers. And then the government would say, wait a minute, you're a Syrian refugee, why are you receiving money from Dubai? They cut. I couldn't, they block it, I couldn't receive any more money. And then the lady was nice enough and she said, why don't you let open a bank account and then I can just transfer the money directly to you. And I don't want to talk about how hard for a refugee to open a bank account in Jordan. <laughs> she starts to send the money and of course the same idea. Why is a refugee receiving money from Dubai? They block it too. And then the lady says, Mohammed, I'm really sorry I can't do it anymore. Why not? After that, my brother just found uh, a coding camp, which is basically, they teach you how to white hacking and protect companies, and protect softwares, which helped him a lot in getting a scholarship that I'm talking about, and we're going to talk about in a while. Me, I took a course in NGO management, and then I was volunteering with an NGO, and then I found a job there. And of course, I was lucky a little bit, because the guy, he was Syrian-American, and because he has the American passport, nobody can talk to him in Jordan. So I was working under the nose of the Jordanian government, but they didn't have any say in it. Moving forward, <coughs> one day my brother comes to me. And he says, did you see this post on Facebook? And the post says, free English lessons for Syrian refugees. And in my background, I have English literature degree. I thought, I'm, you know, I can speak English, I learned English. But why not? It's free. Free is always welcome. <laughs> so he calls the, uh, it was provided by the British Council in Europe. So we called the British Council. They set us a, a date to do the test. We do the test, we got accepted, and we go to the, uh, to the class on the first day. The teacher says, oh, why don't you go around and introduce yourself to each other. And this way you will you know, get to know each other better. 
we went around, we were talking, and I was asking the students there, what are you gonna be next, what are you, what are you gonna do next year when we're done with this? And all of them had the same answer. Next year I'm gonna be in Canada. And I was like, okay, wait a minute, this is a weird. One, two, three people say in Canada, but not the whole class. And when I asked what is it, and they say there is a scholarship from the World University Service of Canada. And if you don't know what WOSC is, it's basically an organization that is funded by the Canadian government. And their mission is to provide refugees with a second chance to complete their education and give them a chance to come to Canada and, as immigrants and be new Canadians. After a year of interviews and exams and all that, my brother and I, we get the scholarship. And they call us on a Sunday. They tell us, congratulations, your flight has been booked. You're flying by the end of this month. You only have two weeks to prepare. So we get ready. Of course, we were flying over the roof <laughs> of happiness. But look, <laughs> that photo was at the uh, airport of Jordan. Uh, we get the scholarship and we come to Canada. But again, when you leave from Dara to Jordan to Nova Scotia, when you leave to a new country, in a situation like my and my brother's situation, you leave your family, your memories, your friends. And you, you have this, this feeling in your gut. You have, am I going to be successful? Is this the right move? Is this smart that I did this? But we'll see. Bear with me. This whole story is sad, but <laughs> believe me, I think it has a happy ending. This leads me to this quote by one of the greatest comedians in history, at least in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Jim Carrey says, Your need for acceptance can make you invisible in this world. Risk being seen in all your glory. Can, can you tell me what's your interpretation of this? Yes, please. Sometimes you need to be the first person to start thinking. Exactly. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, please. Polite women rarely make history. Thank you. Perfect. Yes, please. Live outside the box. Sorry? Live outside the box. Exactly. Don't be afraid to be who you are. Don't say no to any opportunity. If I didn't, if my brother, when my brother came to me and he said, oh, did you see this post on Facebook? I'd be like, it's a scam. <laughs> I wouldn't be here today. If I said no to every opportunity that came to my way, I wouldn't be standing in front of you today. And believe me, there were tons of opportunities that made me who I am today. And I'm really thankful for that. Coming to Nova Scotia, I, I landed on September 1st, 2016, and I literally started school on September 5th, and I only had five day, four days sorry, to know <coughs> where Nova Scotia is, what's, how, how warm the weather is <laughs> in September. Funny thing, when someone, when someone, so I studied at the NSCC, and my friends from NSCC knows who am I talking about. Her name is Ashley. So Ashley messaged me on Facebook and she said, Welcome, Mohammed. You're gonna be, I was in Jordan back then. You're gonna be studying at NSCC. And you know, she will start to prepare me what to expect when to come to Canada and all of that. And I was like, okay, I heard so many things about Canada and the cold weather. Could you please tell me? That was August. Could you please tell me what's the weather like? And she's like, just like Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> so the first day I land, there's thunderstorms, <laughs> there's rain, and the idiot me, I don't bring any winter clothes or anything. So I'm in my shorts and my t-shirt, and I'm like, yeah, excited, get it. And I land, and it's gloomy, thunderstorms and all that. I was like, Ashley, I am. Um, thank you. <laughs> So I started school in 2016 to 2018. And in those two years, believe me, I wouldn't trade them. In my life, this, I had the most experience 
I met so many people who are, I'm grateful for, who loved me and who wanted me to succeed. During those years, because of the support I received, I had a chance to focus on my study and a chance to be a positive community member. So during those two years, I was class representative for two years in this program. And I was an international student ambassador. And my two friends here, they are two international student ambassadors. They know what I'm talking about. So this program basically is all the international students who comes to study at NSCC, you know, they have no clue how the education system or life, or even take the bus here in Canada. So our mission is to make their life easier, to help them integrate in the community. And it's, it's not just about their student life, but even if they have personal life, they can talk, can talk to us, and if we can help, we will. If we can't, we will guide them to someone who will. One of the most important things that I've learned in Canada is volunteer. And when I came through the WISC program, it's called the Student Refugee Program, I, I volunteered with a local committee on my campus. And you can also what I'm talking about. She's a WISC committee member. And in 2017, we had the honor to welcome our first, or oh, basically the second, refugee students. His student, his name is Daniel. Daniel is from South Sudan, and now he's in his second year studying civil engineer technology. 2018, we welcome Mohammed. Mohammed is from Somalia, and he's studying civil engineer technology this first year. I also volunteered at the Elderly Gate Library because the love, the support that I received from Nova Scotians, it's time to pay, pay forward. So I was looking around in the community, where, where, where can I help? And I heard about a conversation class at the Albany Gate Library. They have a huge number of newcomers to Nova Scotia, and some of them speak Arabic. And they were looking for volunteers, so I was like, perfect, I speak Arabic, I speak English, so how can I help? So I started by just translating between you know, the teacher and the students, and then after a while, I get the chance to teach them, actually, and help, help them with their daily needs in terms of, you know, calling the police, calling the hospital if something happens, or go to the grocery store, how do they pay the bills, the credit cards, and all these basic life matters. And then, when I, when I knew when that person, Ashley, her, texted me on Facebook and she said they would come to uh, Nova Scotia. And I was like, oh, excuse me, where, where is that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where Nova Scotia is. And so I started researching what is Nova Scotia, where is it? Like, and, and there's a funny thing that at the bottom, like a tiny font at the bottom of one of the Google search that I did, it says, fun fact, did you know that Halifax has the second most spoken language is Eric. I was like, what? How? How in the world? I never heard about this place before. So I started Googling YouTube. Nothing about Nova Scotia came up, except, you know, the tourism videos, come visit Nova Scotia kind of thing. So when I came here, I wanted to share my experience as a student refugee, as an immigrant, and as an international student who comes to a whole new country to start his life from scratch. So I created a YouTube channel, and I was, the first video that I made is about my campus. What are the services? What is NACC? What are the programs that we had? And people seemed to like it. Then I started talking about daily life, like rent for students, how, like, how to budget your, your money every month, and just basic stuff about living in Canada. What's the difference between Syria or the Arab world? Canada. And I started this channel almost a year and a half ago, and now I have 3,000 subscribers. Living blog. <laughs> Come on. Thank you. And the name of the channel is Canada Line 2. Do I have to explain all?
because you know everyone in the airport was like, why 902? Anyways, so for, I put together a video for this conference just to show to, to show snips of life in Canada to, to show the airport how like how actually we live here. So I made this video. I hope you like it. Student life. 
and you know how students go through hard times in terms of mental health, financial problems, and students with interesting stories, and they found my story interesting. So they asked me to come and talk about my story, how I came to Canada, in of course more detail. And I said, for sure, we did an interview for two hours on the phone, and they were like, okay, we just need you to come to the studio, and we're gonna record for two or three hours. I was like, okay, I go there, I record for six hours straight. I literally lost my voice when I was talking on, my, on the phone with him. The story comes out last two, year, uh, two years ago, in May, and last May, the story wins two awards. <coughs> New York Radio Festival Award, and the high, and uh, sorry, the UN Cultural Something Something Award. It's, <laughs> only, it's basically it's the highest award that a podcast, a podcast or a Seems story can win from yeah. the UN. <coughs> and of course. and you know thank you for the hard work and blah 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 now show me the money <laughs> <laughs> and they're like oh, come they just gave us a black cake and they said go home <laughs> so okay thank you <laughs> <laughs> when i when i came through when i started my uh, youtube channel and i came through the worst scholarship the year i applied for the scholarship, we have 150 applicants on the apartment in 2016. And after I came and I spoke about it with, uh, with the CBC interview and with public speaking like this, 550 people applied. And after I made a YouTube video about how to actually apply step by step to the scholarship and how to, the interview goes and what type of questions they ask, 1,100 people applied. So imagine what one person can, say, can do. It only seriously takes one person to start something good. Now, my plans for the future, I have two major plans. One of them, Mozi Photography, which is a company that I just started four months ago. I started by taking photos of all my phone, actually. I had a Galaxy S7 Edge. <laughs> and, and seriously, and then I, people actually liked my photos. I was like, okay. And then my friend had a Canon camera, and I asked him, can I borrow it, please? And he's like, yeah, of course. I take the camera, I go home, I literally watched every video on YouTube about this camera, and read all, all the articles about how to work this camera, and how to get the most potential from it. I started doing gigs here and there for free, and then people liked it. And then they started hiring me. And I saved the money to get a newer camera. And actually, I bought a camera from my friend. And then I got a new camera. And then I started my business. Why was he? You ask? <laughs> MO is from, of course, my name is Mohammed. SY is from Syria. And .ca is Canada, of course. But later on, since I'm not an English speaker, I learned that Mozi means to find your path, to, to walk your way. I was like, okay, I think it applies because I honestly found my path, I found my passion. And why these dots? If I ask you, tell me your story, what are you gonna do? You're gonna choose certain points, certain milestones in your life. And you say, okay, I graduated, I started working, I started a family, like that. And if you connect those dots, Here's your story, and here's my logo. I want to tell your stories. I want to show who you are. This day I worked with the Premier Office, and this video was, so basically, if you know, they, they brought the, the Special Olympics this year was in Tegnish, in Nova Scotia. And the Premier welcomed all the winners of that uh, Olympics, and he wanted to party with them just, you know, to honor them for their accomplishments. So he asked me to make a video really about this event, and I hope you like it.
bring my family here to Nova Scotia. I have a family who I left back in Jordan, and I want them to have the great future, the second chance that I got here, the love that I got and the welcomes that I received in Nova Scotia. So this is my second major plan, of course, to bring my family here and give them a chance. Before I leave, I leave you with this quote, and it's long enough that I have to read it. <laughs> and it's caused, of course, by Denzel Washington. I love this guy. Dreams without goals are just dreams. You have to have discipline and consistency. You all have gifts. Identify it. What's your gift? It's the thing that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. This is the best thing I've ever heard in my life. That's what you should be doing. Treasure your gift and use it, share it. That's what counts. You know when you go to, to find a job and you hear this, do what you love and you never work a day in your life? This is basically what it is. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you Things like that. So when I came here, I was 
I faced those, those questions. I, a lot, at the beginning, a lot of people, they were shy or afraid to ask questions just because they don't want to offend me. And then, everywhere I go, I just let people, please, if you have any question about what's going on in Syria, who am I? About anything about Islam, because we know what's the stigma about Islams and Muslims. So when when I see when I say this to people, they they they, they feel they are kind of like in a safe bubble, and they start start asking questions, and then they start to learn about what's going on in Syria. And that actually the podcast that I did uh, uh, with CBC helped so much because after that, I, like so many people could. Uh, got in touch with me on social media, people from the States, people from Europe, I don't know how it got the word there, but they were like, of course, thank you for sharing the story, now we know actually. And, and, and I said that in the podcast actually. Even if you've been watching the news, and you know, like for the past six years, and you, about Syria, honestly, you don't know 100, 100% of, like 1% of the truth. Because you know the media, they show what they want, and they have agenda. Unless you live in the situation, you seriously you don't know what's going on in there. So well, honestly, me being open to raise awareness about what's going on, I, I guess this is the best way. If you can't actually help directly in terms of donations and stuff like that, just by raising awareness is as as equal as making a donation. And that goes to any problem that you face in your life or or any anything you hear about is not just about Syria. Yeah. Yes, uh, you talked before about uh, your second biggest dream is bring your the best of your family. Yeah. What are you doing to bring them back? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Honestly, no, don't sell just your yeah. music. Yeah. Sell everything. No. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, honestly, but when I when I get the chance to come to events like this, I talk about this, and I already started the GoFundMe page, where where there's a, people can donate, and I I did cupcakes and sold sold cupcakes just to raise money, and honestly, one of the examples. This is why I love Nova Scotia. And this is why I love Canada. One of the examples people heard about me. I want to bring my family and the stuff that I'm doing in that regard. So one lady, she said, my son goes to this school. And every year they do this event where they play music. It's a musical school. And they sell cookies and cakes and stuff like that. And they raise, raise money for, for their classes. This year, we decided to donate all the money to your, uh, to your cause. <laughs> I'm really speechless. Thank you so much. And so yeah, I, I go to these events, I talk about who I am and my story, and I'm, they actually donated the money. And you know, it's not, it's, it's you know, I, as I said, it's, it only starts with one person. I know it's, it's, it's a lot of money, but you know, it only starts with one dollar. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for asking. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Honestly, one thing that I really learned the easiest way when I came to Canada is to talk to people. Um, when, I, when, I, when I just told people that I'm open to talk about my experience and what happened to me, I felt it's so much easier to talk to people about it and about the problems that I went through. And I remember the first time I told my story in front of people. It was in school, in my class, uh, presentation and then honestly everyone was shy to ask and when they asked I didn't know that my reaction is gonna be this way actually and when they start asking questions I this this was the first time I ever talking about it 
I left the classroom crying. But then after that, I was like, okay, everyone knows my story now. Why am I afraid to talk about it? So that led to CBC, that led to many events, and that led to this event. So don't be afraid to talk about your problems. Just share it with anyone. Well, not every anyone. The ones you trust, close, close friends. And I'm sure they, if they won't be able to help you, they will guide you to someone who will help you. Any more questions? Well, thank you so much again. Thank you.